All right. So we're recording, and it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Laura Kenefek. She is presenting for us today. Uh, Laura is a silviculturalist at the, the U.S. Forest Service uh, based at the University of Maine. She has a degree, uh, undergraduate degree from the University of Binghamton in New York, a master's from the State University of New York, College of Environmental Science and Forestry, and then a PhD from the University of Maine in forest resources. Some of her current research include the ecology and silviculture of mixed species stands, and there are several different projects within that, including the dynamics of multi-age stands, rehabilitation of degraded stands, and then the relationship between forest management and understory vegetation. And then there are other research projects. Um, she's a member of the Society of American Foresters and the Ecological Society of America, and she has published very broadly. Some of you I, I know know Laura through your work with uh, the Society of American For New England Society of American Foresters. She's published um, extensively pages and pages of publications, so I'm not going to read those off, but just know that we have a very capable uh, presenter, and it's uh, my pleasure to welcome Laura to the Forest Connect series. And with that, I'm going to mute my microphone, and I'm going to hover here in the background, and we'll, uh, we'll en enjoy this presentation. Thank you, Laura, for joining us. Thank you, Peter, for that introduction. Today we're going to talk about maintaining the health and productivity of spruce fir forests. This is going to be a northeastern perspective on sustainable spruce fir management. I'm going to try to give you a comprehensive overview of the ecology and silviculture of the spruce fir forests of New England and adjacent states and provinces. The context for this presentation is the forests of the northeastern U.S. The most common forest type in this region is the beech, birch, maple, or northern hardwood forest. That's shown here in the khaki green. We also have other hardwood forest types in the region, including the oak hickory, more in the southern and coastal areas, and pine. Um, when we look at... We look additionally, we have a fair amount of aspen birch um, in the most northern part of Maine. The topic of today's presentation is what's shown here in the yellow. That is the spruce fir forest. This is actually the southern extent of a forest type that extends far into Canada. Contrary to what this map shows, the forest does not stop at the Canadian border. So I want to start by reviewing the habitat types that we recognize within the spruce fir forest. These were defined by Marinus Westfeld, a U.S. Forest Service researcher who worked from the 1920s to the 1950s in this region. And the concept is similar to that of the habitat types for northern hardwoods in New Hampshire that Bill Leak has published about in our region. So there are two types of habitats dominant softwood sites and secondary softwood sites. So the dominant softwood sites include spruce swamps, which are characterized by poor drainage, hardwoods are generally excluded, and spruce fir, northern white cedar, and large are common. The spruce flats occur on glacial till. They are somewhat poorly to poorly drained with low fertilization. And common species in our region include spruce fir, red maple, paper birch in eastern hemlock. And I have a picture from uh, spruce flat shown here on your upper right. The last dominant softwood type that we recognize is the spruce slopes, and these are the high elevation spruce forests. There are also secondary softwood habitat types, and those include the mixed woods, which are dominated by spruce fir, sugar maple, yellow birch, and American beech, shown here on the bottom right. And then the old field spruce. These would be agricultural areas that have regenerated to spruce-dominated stands. I mentioned Marinus Westfeld. He was one of the first U.S. Forest Service silviculturists in the Northeast, and we know him today as the father of spruce fir silviculture. He is shown here on the left with some of his colleagues in Maine. 
He worked in the first half of the 20th century on silviculture of spruce fir with particular attention to maintaining softwoods in stands where there were competing hardwoods. Much of his work was conducted on the Gale River Experimental Forest in New Hampshire. That's a Forest Service research site that's now closed, but it was an important location for early work in this area. He also consulted on work at the Paul Smith Experimental Forest, now the Paul Smith College Forest, previously the site of federal research, and the Penobscot Experimental Forest in Maine, a research location that's still going strong after 60 years. There isn't much about spruce fir ecology and silviculture that Westfeld didn't know 80 years ago, but that hasn't stopped us from trying to reinvent the wheel multiple times. So you'll hear a bit more about his work in this presentation. The spruce fir forests of the Northeast are south of the true boreal forest. This is a mixed species forest with composition and abundance varying in response to site and management history. So common species in our region include the spruces, primarily red, but also white and black, balsam fir, eastern hemlock, northern white cedar, eastern white pine, and hardwoods such as the maples, birches, beeches, and aspens. On the better sites, you will get sugar maple and yellow birch. On the more poorly drained sites, red maple and paper birch. This image from the U.S. Forest Service Silvix Manual shows the range of red spruce. This is known as the signature species of the spruce fir or northern conifer forest in our region. It ranges from southeastern Canadian provinces through Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont in the Adirondack region of New York. There are high elevation occurrences down to the mid-Atlantic states. It is this high elevation spruce that has previously exhibited an increase in growth. This has been documented by my colleague Paul Schaberg in Vermont and others. He attributes that to recovery from the effects of acid deposition. So let's review the characteristics of red spruce. It is very shade tolerant, has a longevity of 250 to more than 400 years, and can persist as advanced regeneration for more than a century. Seeding is infrequent and early establishment is fragile. Within the spruce fir forests, spruce is ubiquitous except on very wet sites. It has few pests and it is fairly resistant to damaging agents. So these images show some of the characteristics of red spruce. On the left, we see what is called an umbrella spruce. This is the characteristic form of spruce in a suppressed understory position. So it will develop a very flat top um, and is likened to an umbrella. We also see here some old growth red spruce. These trees are more than 300 years old. It's common for spruce in natural stands to live through multiple rotations of shorter lived companion species such as balsam fir. This is the range of balsam fir again from the Silvix manual and we see that it covers a much greater area. Here in the northeast we are at the southern part of the range of fir which is a boreal species. Fir is also very shade tolerant, but it has a shorter longevity, only 7 to 150 years. So this is a fraction of spruce. It persists as advanced regeneration for 20 to 50 years, and its seeding is dependable, occurring every two years with robust early establishment. Within the fir, spruce fir forest, it is fairly ubiquitous, except on drought, droughty sites. It has numerous um, pests. It is prone to stem rot. It is the preferred host of the spruce budworm and the balsam woolly adelgid. This results in the shorter uh, lifespan for this species. We refer to that as the pathological longevity. So here are some examples of balsam fir and the factors that um, control its growth and length of um, its life. We see here on the left um, fur that has been killed by the budworm. And on the right, we see a first stand that is breaking up. 
fur is very susceptible to decay, particularly on poorly drained sites. Uh, we commonly see wind throw and breakup of whole stands or substand units when fur reaches its longevity. For these reasons, silvicultural treatments often favor spruce, especially red spruce over balsam fir in northeastern forests. I do see I'm getting some questions. I'm going to save those for the end of the presentation, but please enter them as they occur to you. Spruce fir forests in our region occur primarily as stratified mixtures due to different species height growth rates. So these stands may be even aged from past stand replacing disturbances, like the stand shown here on the left, or they could be irregularly uneven aged due to frequent small scale disturbances, which predominate in our region. Gap phase dynamics drive the development and structure of these forests. We see individual tree mortality from senescence, insect defoliation, wind, and partial cutting. Spruce fir forests in our region have not been extensively cleared for agriculture. When we think of the historical use of these forests, white pine harvest often comes to mind. We know about the king's pine and the harvesting of large trees of that species going back to the 1600s. In fact, by the end of the Civil War, the spruce harvest had exceeded that of pine in our region. The pulp industry then emerged in the late 1800s dominating the use of spruce. We saw repeated cuts from above to successively smaller sizes, culminating in clear cutting around the time of the spruce outbreak, spruce budworm outbreak in the mid 20th century. Due to regulation, we then saw a shift to partial cutting uh, in the late 1990s. This includes everything from shelter wood and improvement cutting to exploitative treatments like diameter limit cutting. Overall, we've seen through time a species shift toward balsam fir and red maple and an age shift toward younger stands. The data shown here um, is, from, is about forest types in New England. It is courtesy of my colleague Randy Morin with U.S. Forest Service FIA. This is from a presentation he made earlier this year at the New England SAS, and I really liked this information and I wanted to share it with you today. So we've already talked about the forest type groups in New England um, and the Northeast, and in the New England states at least four of them make up over 80% of the forest area. And as I said, the northern hardwood or maple beech birch forest is the most um, abundant. However, spruce fir forests make up 20% of the forest area, and they have historically been extremely commercially important. We look here at the stand size class distribution in terms of proportion of forest land for large, that is saw timber, medium pole timber, and small sapling size stands. And interesting to see that the spruce fir forest type is unique in that it has a higher proportion of stands in the small or sapling size class than it does in the medium to large size classes. And this is not the pattern for the other forest types. The other forest types are dominated by large to medium diameter stands. So this is um, a consequence of past and current harvesting. So to continue with a sort of overview of the statistics of this forest, when we look specifically at the spruce fir forest type, um, one third of which in New England occurs in, in Maine, this is what we call the Acadian forest, named after uh, the Acadian region, which is a reference to the French settlers in this area. We see that the top five trees in terms of number of merchantable stems are balsam fir, at close to 30%, and then red spruce and northern white cedar each at 20%. Now when we look at growing stock volume, which is not included on this slide, red maple and balsam fir dominate. Looking to the saplings, we see that over half of them are balsam fir with 15% spruce and 5% cedar. 
these results are similar to the seedling size class, balsam fir 40% and cedar 16 and spruce 13. So this raises some questions about the future forest composition because of the predominance of fir, particularly in um, the smaller size classes and the low proportion of red spruce and other companion species. So as I said, the spruce fir or northern conifer forests of the northeast are working forests. They have many product values and we have a history and of, of extraction for lumber, pulp and paper, chips and biomass. There are also important non-commodity values associated with this forest. This includes its contribution to regional biodiversity and the many different types of wildlife habitat that are provided. For example, the American Martin is often found in late successional forests with home ranges of less than a tenth to more than six square miles. The Canada Lynx is associated with early successional spruce fir habitat with home ranges of 10 to 20 square miles. And then the white-tailed deer. Deer use primary winter shelter in softwood dominated stands at least 35 feet tall with a canopy closure of 70% and secondary winter shelter in stands with 50 to 70% canopy closure. The deer also play an important role in shaping the composition and development of our forest, which is something I'll speak about a little later. Insect pests of concern include the spruce bark beetle. Historically, this was found in spruce-dominated stands with an average DBH of 16 inches and at least 150 square feet per acre. It is a concern today in stands with a high volume of deadwood, such, such as those that were damaged by a tornado last year at Baxter State Park in Maine, and I, I have a picture of that here for you. And um, we are doing a study in collaboration with the park and faculty at the University of Maine, including Sean Fravor, to quantify the amount of deadwood in the insect population response to that. Another important um, insect pest is the spruce budworm. This is cyclical in terms of its outbreak, and it is currently in outbreak status in Quebec. This is a native insect. I recently saw a presentation at a conference in Quebec where um, some researchers had looked at cores similar to the cores that they take for pollen studies out of bogs and other places, and they looked at the distribution of the droppings from spruce budworm and found that it's present um, back thousands of years in time. So this is one that's ours and we've had for a long time. The balsam woolly adelgid is introduced. Uh, this comes from Europe. It was previously confined to the southern and coastal portions of the fur range, but it has been moving north due to climate change. And then lastly, of the important uh, insects that we think about with this forest type, the hemlock woolly adelgid, also introduced from Asia, has been causing mortality in the just south of the spruce fir range where hemlock is more abundant, but it is a concern in the area where there is uh, overlap between the ranges of eastern hemlock and spruce and fir. This is a risk map prepared by the U.S. Forest Service Forest Health and Monitoring, monitoring pardon me, that shows the projected mortality over the next 25 years. Um, due to balsam woolly adelgid. This is as a percent of basal area. The light pink is 5 to 15 percent, red 15 to 25, and the brick or dark red color is more than 25 percent. So as I said, we're looking for most of the impact of balsam woolly adelgid to be um, in coastal regions, but it is moving north and inward. This photograph shows the characteristic fiddle shape that occurs in the crowns of affected trees due to dieback and regrowth of the leader. Spruce budworm. We see here on the risk map a greater projected mortality due to the ongoing outbreak in Canada. The budworm is projected to be in Maine in two to three years. 
it is anticipated that the effect will be more similar to that of the 1940s budworm outbreak than that that occurred in the 1970s, so not as severe as the 1970s and 80s outbreak. This is because we now have less mature fur. You recall the forest age class distribution that we looked at earlier in the FIA data. There's an abundance of young stands. And there's also the suggestion that climate change may play a role. Um, there's some research that suggests that the southernmost extent of the spruce budworm um, is moving north, and also that climate change may cause um, problems from a spruce budworm perspective with regard to the synchronicity of bud flushing and the budworm's life cycle. Balsam fir is more susceptible due to its earlier bud flushing, but defoliation and mortality of red spruce occur at the height of, of outbreaks. So we see here in the graph um, for red spruce ring width on the y-axis and year on the x, and this is a, an example tree. These are the from an increment core, and it shows a decrease in growth in the 19 teens and the 1980s in response to budworm outbreaks at that time, and the tree um, was and is able to recover. This map from one of my Canadian colleagues shows the current 2013 outbreak in Quebec. So this is going on right now. It is primarily on Cote Nord, the North Shore. Um, at this time, Quebec is in a pre-salvage and salvage mode. They um, do not use chemicals um, and so are looking to harvest uh, valuable stands and stands that are determined to be vulnerable due to a high proportion of fir and um, tick out trees that may die or have died. New Brunswick, on the other hand, is using a target, targeted aerial spray of Mimic, which is an insecticide, as an early intervention strategy intended to prevent the outbreak and spread of the insect in their province. So that is a new strategy for them, and we're all watching to see what happens. There was a lot of interesting information about the spruce budworm recently presented at a conference in Quebec. After the last outbreak, the, the northeastern region, which had previously had a lot of research on spruce budworm, dismantled that research capacity. The budworm is endemic to Quebec, and so they have maintained a research program, and, and we now can learn a lot from the work that they've had going on. Lastly, the hemlock woolly adelgid is another of the important insects that I mentioned with regard to this forest type. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. Um, it has been causing defoliation and mortality in central New England. It is moving north. Uh, so far, it has been limited by cold temperatures. However, climate change and the evolution of cold hardy insects suggest that it is coming our way. Where hemlock is an important component, species, uh, component of spruce fir stands, this will change the stand composition and the dynamics. So I now want to move on to the ecology and silvics of the dominant uh, species associated with the forest type we're talking about today, spruce and fir. So I have two photographs here, one that shows a seed trap in the 1950s. This is a historical study of the seeding of spruce and fir. And then we also have a really nice example of a spruce that has regenerated on a stump which has long ago decayed. So an important aspect of forest sustainability is the regeneration of new trees and stands. The seed viability of spruce and fir has been found to be one year. These are not species that bank. You can't remove all the spruce and fir from a site and expect them um, to grow back later. Seedbed preferences differ. Spruce is often associated with deadwood. It is more prone to desiccation when it is young due to shallow roots and a low root to shoot ratio. Advanced regeneration of spruce and fir is very important to the manage, management of these species because they are shade tolerant and they are slow growing relative to um, many of the associated species that they are competing with. 
So spruce and fir are both able to establish in a shaded understory position, persist for decades uh, or a century, and respond well to release. And yes, the uh, suppressed umbrella spruce will respond to release as long as the form isn't so bad that it'll get broken off. And I'll talk a little bit more about form later. So here we see some photographs showing a um, spruce uh, beneath a thicket of saplings, and then also some spruce and fir in a shelter wood that are showing excellent leader growth. The failure to establish seedlings in advance of an overstory removal will lead to either regeneration failure or spruce and fir that are outcompeted by faster growing species such as shade intolerant hardwoods or sprouting red maple. So I want to return here to some of the findings of um, Marinus Westfeld, the father of spruce fir silviculture. His work remains highly relevant to um, our management today. So here we see the potential for release that spruce has. The graph shows two lines. Um, the axes are cumulative height growth, and then the bottom is years following cutting. And so the top line, the solid line, is the growth of spruce that have been released. And the bottom line is growth of spruce that are underneath a canopy. And we see that after about a decade, there's almost four feet um, of height difference between uh, saplings in these two conditions. One of the things that we like to talk about with the spruce fir forest is what is called the advanced growth effect. And that's a phrase that um, I'm getting from David Smith, the famous silviculturist at Yale. And what it refers to is the ability of um, both of these species, but particularly spruce, to grow within the canopy of a larger tree. So we see here an example of that on the right. And you can get a, a whole shade tolerant tree growing underneath the crown of a larger tree. So it's almost like you got double utilization of growing space. And that seems like a really great idea if you want to grow some small trees up to replace the large ones when they're harvested. But the data from Westfeld show us that in order to grow um, at, at good rates, we want to make sure those trees are released. So here's an example of the ability of red spruce to respond to release. This is an increment core, the image um, provided by Sean Freever at the University of Maine. And we see change in radial increment in millimeters on the y-axis and date on the x-axis. And this shows a red spruce that persisted in a suppressed understory condition for about 100 years. It then experienced a canopy disturbance, and in this case, it was the 19 teens budworm outbreak. This caused defoliation and mortality of overstory trees, um, likely a good proportion of fir in the stand where this tree was located, and we see then a rapid um, and sustained increase in growth. So again, returning to the potential for release, here are some more um, data from Westfeld's work in the 1920s, and it demonstrates the importance of well-established advanced regeneration for composition control. So here again, we have um, accumulated height growth in feet on the y-axis and years following cutting on the x-axis. So the line on the top, is spruce advanced regeneration that was five feet tall at the time of release. The line on the bottom is spruce advanced regeneration that was only half a foot tall. And we see that both did show an increase in growth following removal of the overstory. However, the line in the middle that's like shooting off into space is a hardwood that was established at the time of cutting. And what we see is that that rapidly overtakes the six inch spruce and it catches up to the height of the five foot spruce after about a decade. So here is a final graph from Westfeld that demonstrates the importance of release of red spruce, both from overstory competition and from competition within the lower stratum. 
So the graph here that is consistently increasing over time is a spruce that was released from hardwood competition. The graph in the middle that looks sort of like a bell curve is a spruce that was initially released um, from overstory competi competition, but then um, was subjected to competition from invading hardwood. So you see an initial period of release, and then the growth drops off. The one on the bottom is spruce under a hardwood canopy. So this really demonstrates some of the important dynamics in understanding the growth and development of spruce in these mixed species stands. It's important to release them and um, to maintain that release from more aggressively growing competitors. So I want to also talk just briefly about the effect of stem form and architecture on competitive advantage. The image of the trees here on your left shows the actual average height and crown size of red spruce and a common associate eastern hemlock in different canopy strata in uneven age stands. And what we see is that they start out about the same, but over time, the red spruce has uh, a smaller crown. It doesn't hold its lower branches as long as the hemlock. It occupies less growing space. It is thus less competitive. And having a shorter crown, it has um, a more conical stem. It's less tapered. So it's not necessarily as wind firm as the hemlock is. The graph on the right shows root biomass in thinned and unthinned spruce and fir. This is work conducted by colleagues at the University of Maine. And what they found is that in both pre-commercially thinned and non-pre-commercially thinned stands, balsam fir consistently has greater root biomass than red spruce. It also increases proportionally more upon release. This confers a growth advantage. It also implies greater resistance to drought and more wind firmness. This graph um, indicates the relative growth of balsam fir and spruce. So here we have cumulative height growth in inches on the y-axis and years following cutting on the x. And this is sort of the bottom line with regard to understanding um, spruce fir forests. Fir grows more rapidly and it outcompetes spruce early in its life. So spruce is at a competitive disadvantage. In unmanaged stands, ultimately what's going to happen is the fir will reach its pathological longevity, we will start to see it break up and die, and the spruce will persist. That shifts the species composition more towards the spruce. In managed stands, we often intervene prior to that time. That allows the fir to maintain its competitive advantage over time. Additional concerns related to the susceptibility of the two species to decay, breakage, and wind throw um, need to be considered. So these define vigor and risk or the potential of a tree to die. Balsam fir, highly susceptible to damage and decay. If something happens to the stem of a fir, it's going to be rotten. It is not able to compartmentalize that wound. Red spruce does a better job at compartmentalization, but damage to the stem does increase the probability of breakage, particularly if the wood has been exposed. Additional considerations include stem form and the height to crown ratio. That's a function of stand density and past management. So a stem that is shaped like a cylinder is less wind resistant, while one that's shaped more like a cone is more resistant. All of these things suggest that we must conduct careful logging and also consider the vigor and form of residuals when selecting the trees to favor and manage stance. Management of spruce fir types has been guided by 
two management guides. These were written by Bob Frank, a longtime U.S. Forest Service researcher, and others in 1973 and 1978. These were based on research at the Penobscot Experimental Forest in Maine. Uh, they had about 20 years of results at that time. That work is still ongoing, and we now have more than 60 years of findings. So I want to just make you aware of a new guide that is expected to be out in fiscal year 2015-2016. This will be the Silviculture Guide for Red Spruce and Associated Species. This publication is a collaborative effort between the U.S. Forest Service and um, the University of Maine with Bob Seymour, the silviculturist there, um, co-author on the work. The title recognizes the important role of red spruce in this forest as well as the mixed species nature of the stands. It will um, be based on six, de six decades of experiments um, here in the Northeast as well as related studies throughout the um, uh, southern portion of Canada. This is going to be a U.S. Forest Service general technical report and will include forest types and extent landscape and habitat, soils, impacts of climate change, natural disturbance dynamics, the history of exploitation, and alternatives for management. I've mentioned a few times now the Penobscot Experimental Forest. Um, I am the lead scientist there, and that's primarily where I conduct my research. So I want to share some of the specific work that we've done with you. It is located in east central Maine, close to the Penobscot River, about 10 miles from Bangor. And if any of you are interested to visit the forest, either individually or part of a group, please get in touch with me at any time. That's something that we're happy to arrange. So the Penobscot Experimental Forest uh, is close to 4,000 acres in size. It was originally owned by forest industry. In fact, it was purchased by nine industrial and land holding companies solely for the purpose of leasing it to the federal government for research. Ownership transferred to the University of Maine Foundation uh, in the 1990s. So today the forest is operated as a cooperative effort between the university and the Forest Service for research, demonstration, and education. The Forest Service has been conducting long-term civiculture experiments there since 1950. As an aside, for those of you who are not familiar with the Experimental Forest Network, the U.S. Forest Service Research and Development maintains 80 of these sites nationwide. They're places where uh, ecology, management, um, other related research can be conducted. They're designated by the chief. They're usually associated with national forests, but not always. So it's a secure location for long-term forestry work. So here are some photos of the Penobscot Experimental Forest in 1950, and they're representative of the northern conifer forest in that region at that time. As I said, this is the Acadian Forest. Uh, when we talk about the habitat types that Westfeld proposed, these would be spruce flats. Um, in addition to spruce and fir, there are significant components of eastern hemlock, northern white cedar, red maple, and paper birch. The history of this particular site is that there was a water-powered sawmill established in the late 1700s that has been reconstructed and is on the site maintained by the Maine Forest and Logging Museum. It was never cleared for agriculture, but it was repeatedly selectively cut for desired species through the late 1800s. By the mid-1800s, there were at least 100 water-powered sawmills nearby on the Penobscot River in Orono and Old Town. Early 20th century surveys suggested that this was primarily in a grading second growth forest with scattered residuals of older trees. This map shows the boundaries of the experimental forest and the cream areas are the stands that we have under management. Our largest study is called the compartment study. Compartment is an old forest management term, meaning stand or management unit. This study includes 10 treatments, each replicated twice at the stand level with a permanent plot network that dates back to 1950 and has been um, inventoried every five to 10 years. 
this, oh, I see one of the questions here about the relation of this to the Demerit Forest. The Demerit Forest is located about 10 miles away. Um, it is another forest owned by the University of Maine, but distinct from this one. Okay, so getting to the treatments. This is pretty interesting because when the experiment started, they went out and they did pre-treatment inventory. Thank goodness they remembered to do that. We didn't always. And what we found is that there were no differences in composition and structure among the stands that were used for the experiment. So they were all the same when they started. But they have followed very different developmental pathways and look very different today because of the different treatments that have been applied. So we have experiments in shelter wood with two-stage and three-stage overstory removal. Um, we have that with and without pre-commercial thinning. We have single tree selection cutting, so that's uneven age management to um, maintain multiple different sizes and ages of class, age classes of trees in a stand. This is applied on five, 10, and 20 year cutting cycles. And then we also have exploitative treatments. These were included in the study as examples to compare what was regarded as good silviculture in 1950 to what was actually happening on the landscape. This includes commercial clear cutting. This is not silvicultural clear cutting. Silvicultural clear cutting is removing all the trees intentionally to regenerate a new stand after the fact. Commercial clear cutting, which has also been called unregulated harvesting or logger's choice, is just taking everything that is commercial or merchantable. So it's like a really heavy high grade. Then we also have a fixed diameter limit cut in which everything larger than certain sizes is removed, and a modified or flexible diameter limit cut in which the diameter limit varies so that we are doing some tending and leaving some trees larger than the diameter limit. Lastly, there is a reference area that serves as a control for the experiment. And you get a visual impression of how different these are from the images on this slide. So I want to start um, with the single tree selection and just uh, provide you with some information about our recent findings as they relate to spruce fir management in general. So the graphs on the left, this is volume in cubic meters per hectare. Um, Sorry to all of you in the States, but those in Canada might understand that. Um, the values aren't as important as the, the changes over time. So these are the two stand replicates for each treatment. And what you see is frequent light harvests in the five-year selection, slightly heavier harvests in the 10, and even heavier still in the 20. So the longer the cutting cycle, the more um, volume we remove at each entry. Residual basal area of trees larger than a half inch in diameter breast height ranges from 80 in the 20 year selection to about 115 in the five year selection. So this graph shows the relationship between age and size of fir and spruce trees in these three different treatments, the five, the 10, and the 20 year cycle. And what we see, it's not the, the specifics of the numbers, but rather the strength of the relationship that I want to convey to you, is that in the all three cutting cycles, so in the five year, we remove a tenth of the volume each time. In the 10 year, we move one fifth. And in the 20 year, we move one third pretty good relationship between balsam fir age and size. So small trees are young and the large trees are old-ish. Red spruce, on the other hand, is not looking so good. In the heavier cutting cycle, so the 20 year where we remove more, we see a better relationship between age and size. But as we go to the shorter cutting cycles and lower residual, um, the higher, pardon me, the higher residual basal area, so more competition from the overstory, we see that the relationship between age and size breaks down for red spruce. And particularly in the five-year cutting cycle, a tree that is 10 centimeters in diameter at breast height, so that's like four inches, and one that's 50 centimeters, that's like 20 inches, both could be about 100 years old at breast height. So these are the ages that the trees reached breast height, that height that foresters really start to care about. So this relationship does improve with the heavier cuts, but um, it's not actually super news that a lot of the small red spruce are just really old. 
So here's an illustration of that. This is a slide provided by my colleague Bob Seymour, and um, that's him here in this photo. And what he's showing us is that these two trees, the pole-sized spruce and this large saw timber, are exactly the same age at breast height. Ecologically, this is not a problem. But from a sustainability of production standpoint, this is undesirable. Both these trees are right now about 125 years old. When we turn to the seedlings, and this is um, the average age and maximum age of seedlings in our partially cut stands on the PEF, all of these were less than one foot tall. Um, and we looked at about 1,500 seedlings, cut them off um, right at ground level and aged them. And what we see here is that on the left, average age, that's average amount of time it takes for those trees to reach the, that size. And it takes about 9 to 12 years for spruce and 4 to 7 years for fir for these trees to reach 1 foot in height. The maximum age, so how long it, the most it can take, is uh, close to 40 years for spruce and over 30 years for fir. Hemlock, the uh, information is similar, so the same, about the same amount of time for hemlock. Red maple is growing much faster. And that's not actually super, that it can take close to 40 years for spruce to get to be one foot tall. There is a treatment in which we saw better recruitment of red spruce, and that is our uniform shelter wood. This was conducted with a three-stage overstory removal. All that refers to is how many cuts we used to take off the overstory. So the first cut removed a third of the initial basal area, the second removed a half, and the remaining basal area was taken in the third cut. This was about 17 years after we started the shelter wood removal sequence. Everything over two inches was taken out at that time. We did do pre-commercial thinning. That's shown by the decrease in basal area. There's the dotted line um, about 10 years later. That treatment um, reduced spacing to a 2 by 3 meter um, space between crop trees, and it favored spruce. As long as the spruce was at least half as tall as a fir, they would cut down the fir to release the spruce. So here again is um, our friend Bob Seymour in the shelter would stand on the PEF, and these trees are um, about 40 years old, and it shows that we have excellent red spruce crop trees at that time. And in fact, um, a commercial thinning was conducted about 10 years earlier in some portions of these stands. So we saw in the partially cut stands with the heavy overstory, it can take 40 years for spruce just to get to be a foot tall, where, where we did an overstory removal and then release, they uh, reached merchantable size in that amount of time. Another variation of the shelter wood that we have information on is the two-stage overstory removal. And here we kept residuals. So don't let the number of stages of overstory removal um, confuse you. Originally, they intended this to be a comparison of three-stage versus two-stage. But because they left all trees smaller than six inches, and all of those that the logger didn't want in the 1960s, which you can see from this picture was a fair amount, this actually created a 2 H stand. So this is, this is shelter wood with reserves. What we found, and it's illustrated here in the change in basal area over time in the two stage and the three stage on the same graph, is that initially after overstory removal, the two stage shelter wood with reserves had a higher basal area. And the basal area remained higher for a long time. However, the rate of increase in basal area in the stand where all the residuals have been taken off, so just a completely even age stand, um, it was faster. So it accumulated basal area faster, and by 45 years, that basal area had surpassed that in the two-stage stand with residuals. This reflects the suppressing effect of the residuals on the new cohort as well as the decline in mortality of those residuals. There are a lot of fir close to six inches that were left. In addition, those trees that the logger didn't want. So this shows us that it is important to choose residuals with our goals in mind. 
when you're looking at reserves, if you want them for wildlife habitat, you want them to become snags and uh, recruit down woody material, then it's totally fine to keep trees that don't look super vigorous. However, if you're wanting to accumulate growth on those trees, then you want to select vigorous trees and those with a longevity that's going to allow them to persist at least until it's time to come in and do a commercial thinning on the new cohort. Continuing on the shelter wood topic, we also have irregular shelter wood. This was installed by my predecessor. He left residual medium to large saw timber crop trees um, and trees in that size class also to become snags. He removed half of the volume, leaving 20 to 30 trees per acre larger than 13 inches. One of the concerns that was raised about this was wind firmness. Can you leave these large spruce and not lose them? Well. Those data are shown here on the left for after the initial treatment and 10 years later. We see that there was some recruitment of trees into the saw timber class and there was also some mortality. The net change for spruce and pine was 0%. Eastern hemlock, we had a reduction of 4% and I can tell you that was not wind, that was porcupines. It helps that this particular stand had been managed in the past that conferred some wind firmness to the saw timber size trees. Wind firmness is also a consideration for intermediate treatments in even age spruce fir stands. The University of Maine has conducted an experiment in which they removed 30 to 50% of relative density in stands that had previously been pre-commercially thinned. They found the best growth at the 50% removal. Lighter removals are needed in stands that have not had previous thinnings. In general, a height diameter ratio of 80 and a live crown ratio of at least 30% should confer wind firmness in stands where you're removing up to a third of basal area. We've also done some work on germination sites. So let's switch gears a little bit to the regeneration phase. And what we found is that the density of red spruce and eastern hemlock regeneration on dead wood is higher than would be expected. If you compare it on wood to adjacent forest floor, you find more of it on the dead wood. And this is likely due to the moisture holding capacity associated with the decaying woody material. Balsam fir densities are not differentiated between uh, different substrate types. And this likely is related to uh, some of the data we saw earlier about the greater um, fir root biomass. So, you know, this isn't a surprise. We see a pattern like this where you see red spruce saplings in a line that often suggests they regenerated on a piece of dead wood. And it confirms historical observations of um, the regeneration substrates preferred by these species. When we look at the density of regeneration across par partially cut treatments, and this is from our study on the PDF, it's high. We have 10,000 to 15,000 seedlings per acre. But a third of those are balsam fir. Red spruce accounts for 15% and the rest are eastern hemlock and hardwoods, especially red maple. The implications of this are that it's really difficult to maintain a high proportion of red spruce in these managed stands given the abundance of competing species without deliberate um, selection for and release of the spruce. Red spruce is also further disadvantaged by browsing. The photograph here on the right is one that I took. This is a red spruce seedling that has turned into a bonsai tree due to repeated browsing from snowshoe hair. Once established, recruitment to the sapling size class or to breast height is important for sustainability of production and composition in managed stands. As I mentioned earlier, in natural stands, the spruce is gonna outlive the balsam fir. If we are regenerating the stands before that happens, that perpetually allows fir to be in that rapid growth competitive stage of development. So here we see a spruce crop tree on the left that has been released and one on the right growing in a dense thicket. These data on recruitment to the merchantable size class for the four most abundant species on the PEF, red maple, eastern hemlock, red spruce, and fir, were compiled by Bob Seymour at the University of Maine. This is the number of trees that grew into the five inch class between 1977 and 2012. 
Bob assigned some qualitative assessments to these that indicate that the partially cut stands didn't do a super good job of regenerating red spruce. There is a greater amount of red spruce recruitment in uh, the heavier cuts, and particularly here we see that SW3 PCT, that three-stage shelter wood with pre-commercial thinning, resulted in the most spruce of all the treatments that we looked at. In fact, in a study of sapling height growth, so this was saplings uh, 1 to 18 feet tall in uneven age stands, we found that annual height increment is a function of canopy openness. So I've outlined the spruce here in orange, canopy openness or proportion of open skies along the x-axis, and a log of annual height increment on the y. What we see is that less than 15% canopy openness, the hemlock, have a height growth advantage. Above that, the fir have a height growth advantage. It is not distinguished from spruce at some levels, but there is no light level in partially cut stands at which you can confer a height growth advantage to red spruce. So the red spruce must be either initially taller through gradual removal of the overstory that allows them to become established or be released through subsequent treatments. This fact that they're similar um, in height growth, the fir and the spruce at the higher levels, uh, supports some data that we've seen coming out of Quebec that suggests that by manipulating gap size, you can create conditions where the spruce are at least not disadvantaged. So a compromise approach to create larger openings yet maintain structural complexity as associated with uneven age stands has been proposed at the University of Maine. So this is an irregular expanding gap shelterwood with reserves, it's also called the Acadian Famal Schlag. It consists of entering a stand every 10 years and removing 20% of the area in large groups. These are then expanded over time so that they coalesce. The next 50 years of the stand, you have no entries, so this front loads the disturbance and creates an average disturbance rate that is comparable to that observed in old growth forests in this region. This is similar to the group patch approach proposed by Bill Leake in Northern Hardwoods with two important distinctions. One is how you expand and coalesce the gaps in a very planned manner, and the second is the retention of residuals within the gaps both as crop trees and to recruit snags. In addition to structure and composition, we need to consider growing stock quality. Risk factors such as poor vigor, structural weakness, damage, decay, and maturity should be considered when selecting individual trees to cut or retain and manage spruce fir forests. For this purpose, we have defined acceptable growing stock as trees that are likely to maintain or increase their value. So they're reasonably straight with a minimum eight foot log and free from risk factors such as poor vigor, thin or discolored crown, small live crown or dead top, structural weakness, forks, silt roots, a lean more than 15 degrees, and damage such as sap sucker holes, branch stripping by porcupines, skidding and felling wounds, and broken tops, decay, fruiting bodies, bleeding ants, seeing ants coming out of a tree is never a good sign, swelling and cavities. And then lastly, pathological longevity, as I mentioned earlier, particularly with regard to the fir, a tree of size or age of its species that is high risk. Um, trees that are not free of these factors are what we call UGS, unacceptable growing stock. So here's some interesting data from our experiment on the PEF that shows the proportion of volume that was acceptable growing stock in year 60 for all our different treatments, the 5, 10, and 20 year selection, the flexible diameter limit, the fixed diameter limit, commercial clear cut, shelter woods, and reference. And what we see is that the lowest proportion of eggs occurred in the fixed diameter limit treatment. That was an exploitative treatment, um, and it has reduced the proportion of acceptable trees over time. And quality matters. It matters regarding future stand potential and management alternatives, and also vigor. Trees of poor vigor, vigor are more vulnerable to damaging agents and mortality. The commercial clear-cut, in particular, has degraded residual stand condition. 
Here we harvested all merchantable trees in the 1950s and the 1980s with no attention to tending and regeneration. We see that here in the bar graph, the first cut, followed by regrowth of the basal area, the second cut to a lower residual because merchantability standards had changed, and the dominance of the stand today by sapling sized trees. This had an undesirable effect on species composition in year zero. This was a softwood dominated stand with more than 75% softwood. This is a mixed wood stand with close to 50% hardwoods and softwoods in year 45. And those aren't the hardwoods that you want to have. Here we see sapling sized trees, poor quality residuals, and clumps and voids of vegetation. Overall, a degraded species composition with red maple stump sprouts, pin cherry, gray birch, balsam fir, and some paper birch and aspen. No red spruce regeneration. Sadly, this is representative of many formerly spruce fir dominated stands in the working forest. We have undertaken a study of rehabilitation to explore the future options for these stands. We released crop trees that were at least breast height, hardwoods on a 25 foot spacing and softwoods on a 15 foot spacing. Our objectives were to improve growth, value, species composition and spacing. This was a pre-commercial treatment with mechanical release or herbicide application using Garlon for Ultra in a basal spray. So what did we find? Well, our ability to rehabilitate these stands was limited by the availability of acceptable growing stock. We ended up releasing a lot of red maple stump sprouts. We determined which ones were acceptable and which ones we weren't. We released uh, paper birch, spruce, wherever we could find it, and a number of other species to maintain the diversity of the stands. Someone asked me once, why didn't you cut everything and start over? Well, we wanted to retain structure, the growth we had accumulated on the desirable trees, and the compositional diversity of the stands. This decreased the hardwoods and the call. It increased the crop tree growth. And in our most intensive treatment, where we planted 2-0 container stock red spruce, it increased the um, spruce regeneration density. The bad news is it took a really long time. It took about 20 to 50 student hours per acre. There is some question about whether the students were uh, as efficient as others may have been. However, the cost associated with them per hour was lower. Overall, we spent $380 per acre on crop tree release in the moderate treatment and close to $800 per acre in the intensive crop tree release, timber stand improvement, and planting treatment. The cost is comparable to what has been done operationally in other areas. The crop tree release has been applied by a land trust in central Maine with subsidies from the NRCS. Other options to get this sort of work done would include doing release only, and not doing any of the planting or timber stand improvement, or to wait until the trees are of merchantable size. For those of you who have interest in this topic, there were a number of articles about pre-commercial and commercial rehabilitation, application through case study, and operational considerations in a special section of the May 2014 Journal of Forestry. An aspect of the rehabilitation study I, I want to mention, because it was a surprise, is the browsing of the planted spruce. We planted 176 red spruce seedlings per acre. After three years, more than a third of those were dead, and 87% of the survivors had been browsed. This browsing is by hair and rodents. Even with protective sleeves, frost heave in the winter exposed the seedlings to damage. Across all the treatments on the PEF, we actually see a high proportion of red spruce browsing. So these data are from our entire study uh, collected a couple years ago. 37% of the red spruce seedlings have been browsed. 24% of northern white cedar, not a surprise, that's white-tailed deer. When we look at our primary competitors, balsam fir and red maple, we see browsing percentages of about 5% of stems. So red spruce has a tough all the way around. I want to just briefly mention that we are also looking at the effects of mechanized partial harvesting on commercial timberland in Maine. 
the, the question here is whether partial harvesting with feller buncher and grapple skitter, which is becoming increasingly common in our region, have an effect on residual stand uh, composition and structure that we need to be aware of and consider. What we found is that we had species shifts, more shrubs, grasses, and non-commercial species and hardwoods in the trails, and less advanced regeneration. These trails occupy up to 30% of the stand area. Management of associated species should also be considered in um, any uh, plan that addresses spruce and fir. This is a northern conifer or mixed species forest. One that is of particular interest is northern white cedar. It has had little deliberate management in the past and cut exceeds growth in many parts of the region today. This work was recently summarized as a silvicultural guide and covers some of the important aspects of managing cedar. It's long lived, but it responds to release, although it's slow growing. It can take 100 years just to reach pole size. It often occurs in mixtures, so it's good to think about a multiple treatment approach so you could identify pockets of cedar and manage them within spruce fir stands. You have to be cognizant of the potential for recruitment failures if deer populations are high. This suggests that you need to control deer or hang on to seed trees. We advocate partial cutting as a gradual release of cedar in the understory with regeneration management such as scarification and retention of deadwood. So let's wrap things up with an overview of the key points. In order to have healthy and productive spruce fir forest, I suggest that we need to manage germination sites. This means retaining deadwood, um, having mineral soil available for regeneration. We must establish and protect advanced regeneration of the slow growing shade tolerant species. Otherwise, we're gonna see species shifts to the less shade tolerant, faster growing species. This means that it often makes sense to do partial cutting or a gradual overstory removal and to control skidding. If you consider the trail area placement and reuse, also minimize damage to the residual stems. It is important to manage growing stock, vigor, and quality. We often target mature fir because of the spruce budworm concern and unacceptable growing stock for removal. It's important to avoid diameter limits and other simplistic approaches to density or area management. These result in degraded quality and species shifts. Marking can be a very important part of designating which trees you want to remove and which you want to favor. It's important to control composition by establishing advanced regeneration and retaining seed sources for the future. We must consider associated species, the positive and the negative. Some we want to favor and others we want to discourage. This involves consideration of the silvical properties of these species, this is where silviculture really is applied ecology. In general, it's important to release lower stratum trees and manage stands. They're shade tolerant. They have the potential to respond to release. Notice I said lower stratum, not lower crown class. In an even age stand, if trees are being outcompeted, they're not very promising for the future. But if they're in a lower canopy layer and they were established later, that's a new cohort that you can take advantage of. So this can be done with pre-commercial or commercial treatments. And with that, I'm happy to turn to the questions and I thank you for your attention. This was great, Laura, thank you. Um, so we do have <clears throat> some questions and also some comments. Carl had posted several links that he found related to spruce and fir management and ecology. So I have, uh, I have a question that's I think similar in some respects to a question that Chip had. What, is, what limits or what controls the uh, regeneration of red spruce? I mean, is it irregular seed production? Is it seed bed? Is it seed predation, fungi? Because it, I mean, I, in your presentation early on, you talked about the abundance of different species of seedlings, um, and you showed that red spruce tended to be fairly underrepresented in the mm -hmm. seedling group. Is you know even white cedar had greater abundance in seedlings. So what? Can you talk a little bit about how does red spruce regenerate and what limits its regeneration? Sure. So 
First of all, it's very important to have seed, tree, seed trees present within uh, the vicinity of where you want to have regeneration. We've seen in the past that clear cuts where advanced regeneration was not established do not seed in to red spruce. And one of the things that puts red spruce at a disadvantage, particularly with regard to balsam fir, which is its primary associate and competitor, is, as I mentioned, it seeds less often and the seed are smaller. So balsam fir is like spitting out seed all the time and they're larger, they're able to um, withstand um, desiccation better than the red spruce are. In addition, we see from the regeneration substrate and the fact that spruce, when it first established, is, doesn't have as much root biomass as balsam fir does, that's very susceptible um, to mortality from desiccation. We do find that we have excellent regeneration of red spruce where you have an overstory that has seed trees present and there isn't an excessive amount of competing um, species in the understory. So use of the shelter wood method to gradually open the canopy and establish red spruce. There are different opinions about whether or not scarification is beneficial. We see a fair amount of scarification going on up in Quebec. That's a common forest management tool for them. It's not something that we do as much down here. Certainly if you have established advanced regeneration, you don't want to do that. And you also would want to control your harvest so you're not running over and breaking all of your red spruce regeneration. And that's where the season of harvest can come into play. I did see a question about that. So snow cover can protect established um, red spruce advanced regeneration. I think when we look at scarification, um, I've heard people in Quebec say that they feel that is important for the regeneration of spruce and also yellow birch. They might also be seeing an effect of composition there. It's not uncommon um, in this region for us to do some competition control if once the trees are established through pre-commercial thinning or application of herbicides. Um, in Quebec, they don't do any chemical use whatsoever at all. And so the lack of competition control might mean that they have to focus a little bit more on the regeneration substrate than we do down here where we can come in after the fact and try to adjust the species mixture. Okay. Um, so there are several questions. Um, do you want to read them or do you want me to pull them out and read them to you? How, what's, what would you prefer Why don't best? you read them to me? Okay. I'm pretty brain fried right now. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to scroll back to the top. Um, there was a question, oh, so early on there was a question from Tom about the umbrella spruce and whether or not they would regain good form and you answered that as I recall. You yes, about they it. do respond well to release. I mean, if the live crown ratio is less than something like 15%, you're probably just out of luck. But these trees are able to respond, although a very spindly tree may be subject to breakage. Okay. Um, Carl asked, um, at some point you were talking about the, the effort that went into managing for spruce. He's, he says it sounds like the management of red spruce is uh, management labor intensive. You agree, and I guess maybe within the context of your familiarity with managing for other species, you know, from trying to manage for northern white cedar or northern hardwoods, is spruce more management intensive than other forest types? or? You know, it depends to some extent on the silvicultural approach that you've used. As we've seen, uh, removing the overstory or most of the overstory in the case of 2-H dance over a pretty short period of time can allow you to establish and release red spruce and they will persist even if not in a, a dominant canopy position in a mixture with balsam fir other species. Where we've had challenges managing for the red spruce are in stands with a consistently high overstory. So we're, we're not consistently high proportion of overstory. So we're not getting a period of 
of good release for those trees and in stands where there is a large proportion of balsam fir and eastern hemlock because then you get the double whammy. You get eastern hemlock being most competitive at really light levels and balsam fir at um, the higher light levels. So, you know, I I think there's something to that, you know, that there that there is some intensive aspect of the spruce management. But I think maybe it's more that you have to be thoughtful. Um, and if you are thoughtful about retaining seed trees um, and establishing and releasing regeneration, then some of the challenges that we've encountered um, might not prove to be insurmountable. So it's, a, as you say, a thoughtful or a deliberateness to the management. And then I guess if you inherit a stand that has been mismanaged, then, then you have, as you were pointing out, with the labor costs, um, uh, some, some pretty uh, intensive effort in front of you. Absolutely, 100% correct. Okay, uh, Chip wants to know if the season of harvest frozen versus unfrozen soils will affect the amount of spruce regeneration. Um, as, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I think if you have established advanced, advanced regeneration of red spruce, that harvesting during a time when there is um, snow cover, particularly if you're doing like um, uh, a hand crew skitter operation can be helpful for not running that stuff over. Mechanized harvest tends to concentrate disturbance within trails, so then it's maybe not as much of a problem. There are times when you don't have a lot of red spruce regeneration and you want to open up some space in the understory to get that, then it could be that uh, a fall or a dry summer harvest that um, disturbs more of the ground service and established competing trees could be beneficial for the spruce. Okay. Uh, Harley wants to know about uh, when releasing red spruce seedlings from woody or herbaceous competition, especially hastened fern, is there a recommended herbicide treatment uh, for broadcast spraying? So, so um, there absolutely is. That is outside my area of expertise, but there have been a number of publications out of the University of Maine on um, a competition control in northern conifers, um, primarily from the Cooperative Forestry Research Unit, an industry-funded cooperative. And I would suggest um, that you look for that online, or if you wanted more information, to send me an email and I can look that up. I also wouldn't be surprised if someone else on the call today has experience with that. Personally, on our, our federally owned uh, research forest, we, we haven't used um, herbicides, so it's, it's not something I've done. But if anyone else knows and wants to type their answer in there, I encourage you to do so. Okay. Um, let's see, Tim asks about, asks about in the three-stage uh, OSR, the acronym to treatment OSR, which mm -hmm. I've forgotten now. Overstory oh. removal. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Um, uh, which harvest is classified as the regeneration cut? Okay, so this is a good question. Traditionally, when we think about the stages of the shelter wood, there are three cuts. The preparatory cut, which kind of gets out the stuff that you don't want and improves the vigor of your seed trees. The next is the establishment cut, which is um, when you reduce the residual density sufficiently to establish regeneration in the understory. And then the last cut is going to be the final removal of the overwood. However, with the spruce and fir being so shade tolerant, any partial cut in a stand of seed bearing age will result in regeneration. So the initial cut, the preparatory cut, and the second cut, traditionally called the establishment or seed cut, both will establish regeneration. Okay. Um, is there, oh, Carl asks about the potential for growing red spruce in a nursery until um, they're of a size when they can be relocated um, to, a, to a new managed area. Mm -hmm. I guess you, you did do some of that. So. We did. Ours were, I mean, ours were pretty small. I mean, that they were just, they were 2-0 container stock. Um, we got those from J.D. Irving. 
Um, that company, as many of you know, um, does continue to have a, a very prolific um, tree planting program. Um, planting of red spruce isn't super common. We did it because it um, was a native species that we wanted to um, restore to the site. As far as growing them to a larger size to make them more competitive, I think the logistics of that might be limiting, but um, I haven't tried it. I often where red spruce are planted, the, you have to do a follow-up treatment um, to control hardwood, either with herbicides or mechanical cleaning. Um, in our study, we didn't even get that far because the rabbits ate them all. Did we had some kinds of protection? It looks like we did. We had those plastic mesh sleeves that were like a foot and a half tall, and we set a bamboo shoot next to each seedling and put that sleeve over it. And um, what happened is just the snow and the frost heave in the winter dislodged those sleeves sufficiently so that rodents got in there and ate the spruce anyway. So they they eat more than just the terminal bud. They girdle the. They crunched off the terminal bud and the branches. I mean, these trees went out there. Some of them were like close to a foot tall, and now they're like a few inches tall or totally nipped off. And I think that, um, as I may have mentioned, the rarity of spruce in that area, which had been high graded with spruce removed in the future, as well as um, boosting with fertilizer in the nursery, which would increase nutrients, um, made them particularly vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Uh, so Mark uh, sees, let's see, says on one hand, I see that the expanding group selection would be desirable because of its uh, potential to limit damage. But he said you also recommend slow removal of the overstory through careful logging. And so he's just mm -hmm. wondering about maybe um, how those two compare and then, yep. and then in a very practical sense, uh, which one of those is going to be most useful for managers. Well, the work on the Acadian famous log, which um, Bob Seymour at the university um, came up with um, and initiated out on our forest, has been, um, I think, successful because the group openings are irregularly shaped, so you can still have some sort of shaded environments in there. And he has residuals, um, both to cast seed and for some shade in the overstory. And the amount of residuals varies. What he has done is he lays those out um, with GPS, and then he lays out the expansion similarly with GPS. And they just give that information to the machinery operator. These are marked. They marked the um, periphery of the expansion zones, and they also mark the retention trees, and then everything else is harvested. And by expanding the gaps in this way, they minimize disturbance to um, the um, the, the new cohort. And they also have, and this is interesting because it's contrary to what we usually do, they have asked that the trees be felled into the residual matrix. So the, the tendency is for the logger to fell the trees into the opening, but they don't want that to happen. That's where the new trees are. So they instead ask that they be felled into the matrix, and they concentrate their um, machinery trails around the edges of the gaps. And I think that that treatment, I, I can't say what the proportion of spruce is in it. Bob is going for more of a mixed species composition. He has pine in there and yellow birch. But they are successful for regenerating a northern conifer species mixture. If you wanted something that was more spruce, something that was more similar to a traditional uniform shelter wood that kept a heavier over wood and then removed everything but desired residuals in like a 2 H stand might be a better approach. Okay. And you, uh, the next uh, question was about the word cohort, if you could define that term. Yep. Cohort is just another um, word for an age class. So often, particularly with even age stands or 2 H stands, the new trees that you regenerate um, during your um, cutting are are the new cohort in that stand. And as long as they come within a period of 20 years, we would generally regard them to be a single age class um, and uh, them an even aged stand. OK. Uh, Nancy notes that in southern Maine, foresters are dealing with 
over stories that have been overrun by invasive shrubs, and she's wondering mm -hmm. what consequences uh, this has consequences for regen post harvest regeneration. Um, what concerns do you have for that in terms of northern forests? So, do you see those? Yeah, I think do you see those invasive species further north? Right. Um, we have done a few studies looking at um, invasive plants in managed spruce fir stands, both on our research forest and on um, commercial forest land in western Maine. To date, on the sites that we have studied, we have not seen the problem with invasives that has been observed on southern and coastal Maine. I know some of the islands off Maine are completely overrun with invasive shrubs, and these cause regeneration failures. I think in situations like that, um, the research that I'm familiar with basically suggests that you have to do control of the invasive plants or you are not able to successfully regenerate the um, species that you desire, and that often involves um, application of herbicides or some other labor-intensive um, project. I mean, I would just um, say that retention of your seed trees until you feel that there is an opportunity for successful regeneration and rec recruitment would be a good idea with any competing vegetation, invasive or not. But to date, we're not seeing it as a problem in the um, spruce fir working forest to the degree that it has been observed elsewhere. Okay. Uh, Tom Ward wants to know um, how much planting, it's kind of a two-part question, how much planting of spruce occurs in clear cuts and then could you co-plant uh, white, uh, white pine with the red spruce where the pine would be a higher value nurse crop and out-compete faster growing undesirable species? So um, planting is not as, as, as common here in the uh, spruce fir or northern conifer forests of the northeast as it is in other regions. So I, off the top of my head, don't know what proportion of the forest land is planted, but it is minuscule. Planting is mostly done um, following clear-cut harvesting um, for um, site conversion. That sort of intensive management has become rare due to um, regulatory restrictions. Uh, we do see it um, by one of the large landowners. It's more common across the border in New Brunswick. Red spruce, as I mentioned, is not super common for planting. I think um, among the spruces that white spruce and black spruce um, are, are, are planted perhaps more commonly. And absolutely planting in mixture with white pine or, you know, different spruces in pine um, is a, it's a good idea and it's something that has been seen in, in operations here in the region because, as you say, um, it creates a species mixture that has benefits for form and development and it also adds um, another valuable species that um, can be taken out during later tendings or regeneration harvests. Okay. Um, and I guess along those same lines, is there, uh, do um, people considered or worked with direct seeding in clear cuts as an alternative to, I mean, some, rather than planting going with the direct seeding? Um, not to my knowledge. I, I guess I don't know of anyone doing that. I know that we, in the um, Forest Service did some research on that back in the 1940s and 1950s. Um, I think that it, it hasn't proven to be super effective and it seems to me, just off the top of my head, that establishing particularly shade tolerant conifers after the harvest from seed would result in um, problems associated with desiccation and also um, competition from stuff that regenerated on the site, like hardwoods. Okay. And um, Brian asks a question. I've, I overlooked this before. I apologize to Brian. He wants to know, you'd, you'd mentioned the acceptable growing stock, growing stock criteria, mm -hmm. and he wondered if those had been formalized into a more detailed tree classification system that could be used for tree marking. Oh, um, so our our guidelines as presented here have not. We developed those um, for utilization in our research to assess the effect of the treatments 
on um, vigor and quality. They're based on work done by Ralph Nyland at SUNY ESF in New York. Um, they are covered sort of generally in his civil culture textbook. However, there is a really excellent publication that just came out in the last year from New Brunswick from the Northern Hardwood Research Institute. It's authored by Gaetan Pelletier, and it presents a very um, sort of comprehensive assessment of product potential and um, tree vigor and quality for many different types of um, hardwoods, and it is uh, linked to existing criteria used for tree marking in Canada. So um, you might find that online, or if you email me, I will send a copy of it to you. Super. So, and I have uh, just posted the exit survey. Somebody was asking about that. And um, Laura, this was a fabulous presentation. We had almost 80 people at the peak, um, and I have all the numbers. I'll um, provide a summary to you. But there's a very good attendance, very good interaction here, lots of um, thorough questions, very thoughtful questions, and, and fabulous answers. So I think everybody's walking away very satisfied with um, their improved knowledge of spruce fir forests. So I'm going to uh, call this to a close. Um, I want to thank Laura and thank all the participants. Laura will be back at 7 p.m. tonight to give the same presentation. So if some of you want to see it twice, you're welcome to do that. And we'll um, have it uh, posted up on the YouTube site, uh, hopefully by the end of the week. So thanks to you all and thank you, Laura. Thank you, Peter, and thank you all for your attention. So, Laura, we can, um, uh, the, the site will remain open, and uh, you can just, you can turn off your headset, you can disconnect or turn off your headset or whatever, and then if you want to rejoin at about 6.40 or something like that, 6.45 um, this evening, that would be great. Great. Thank you so much. All Thanks, right. everyone. Have a good thank day. You. Yep. You too.